it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight, and I wouldn't be here without the support of the Brother Faculty, the Department of English, our wonderful chair, uh, Bruce, and uh, I'm so happy uh, that the Dean and is here, and also Ralph Ferguson, who I particularly want to thank, because uh, what I'm going to read tonight is before the trips that I was making. It's how I got to go over the first time. It had to do with the grant, the travel grant from the Ethics Center. Uh, the photographs that you saw up here were all snapshots that I took. Uh, most of them were in Syria, particularly the city of Aleppo, which is one of the hardest, uh, one of the most difficult places to get to, where the fighters have been able to. Uh, more were in Assaz, uh, which until recently was in the hands of ISIS. Um, and the others of the refugees are refugees who have fled this January from the barrel run of Aleppo by the Charlotte forces. There are two uh, titles for this. The first one is all about sex and personal privacy. That was to get you in here. <laughs> the real title is what I shouldn't have held a woman from Kyrgyzstan. On the flight from JFK to Istanbul, a woman from Kyrgyzstan told me she, she had a solution for the conflict in Afghanistan. Just send them gay boys and lots of ecstasy. They'll forget about fighting men. This woman was thin, fair-skinned, and clothed in natural fibers and sturdy footgear. She said she was a self-employed liaison between American donor groups and worthwhile aid projects in Afghani villages. They like gay boys, she whispered. I understood you the first time I said. <laughs> Your English is better than mine. I have a master's degree in international relations from one of your major universities, she said. And I'm also fluent in Dari, Farsi, and Russian. This stopped me. Who did you say you worked for? Do you really expect an answer to that? I didn't. So I told her my own story instead that I was from Alabama by way of Texas, and that I had just put my brother into a nursing home against his will. I was on my way to the ancient city of Antioch, where Christians had first been called Christians, and where St. Paul had begun his mission trips to the wider world. I told her I was looking for faith, which the author of Hebrews had defined as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The woman from Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan shrugged. I don't have any use for religion, she said. The men I work with are addicted to pornography, but they don't approve of the way I dress. Later she told me she also hated movies, novels, anything artificial like that. So I waited until she had cocooned into her thick maroon blanket before I put on headphones and watched an American movie about a novelist whose fictional female character comes to life. It was mid-afternoon in Istanbul when we landed. As we collected our bags from the overhead bin, I thought the woman from Kyrgyzstan might wish me a safe trip, but she was already halfway to the exit before she turned and said, if you're really looking for faith, maybe you ought to just take care of your brother. She didn't know my brother. <laughs> and besides, she was a spy. Although she couldn't tell me that. <laughs> you were damned if you did, damned if you didn't. The same thing applied to religion, I thought, as I stepped out into the miserable heat. What I didn't tell the woman from Kyrgyzstan was that I'd been to Antioch many times before. It was the war in neighboring Syria that had drawn me there. But I wasn't lying to her when I said that I was on a search for faith. I'd found faith in a war before, in El Salvador, during the 1980s. Since then, though, I felt I'd lost it, then found it again when my daughters were born, then lost it when my marriage came apart. So this journey would not only be across the globe and forward in time, but back to my roots, and then deeper still, into places within myself that I'd never known were there. When I was a kid in Alabama, I'd open my eyes during prayer and stare at the maps of St. Paul's mission trips that hung on the wall of my Sunday school classroom. This was Birmingham, 
or Bombingham, as it was called during the 1950s and 60s. And those of you familiar with the American Civil Rights Movement will understand why I wanted to be anywhere but there. My family hadn't traveled further than Florida Panhandle, though, so I thought my best chance to actually see the world might be to retrace St. Paul's travel someday. I later realized, of course, that following the steps of Paul was a metaphor for Christian service, not a sightseeing tour. So I became a writer and college teacher instead. During summers and Christmas breaks, I covered the conflicts in Central America for regional newspapers. During the regular academic year, I continued to teach, but took occasional assignments from magazines and as a stringer for the national desk at the New York Times. The big break came with an assignment to cover the attempted murder trial of a snake-handling preacher who tried to kill his wife with rattlesnakes. This article led me to write a book about the handlers themselves. I briefly became one. Talk about faith. But that was not the most dangerous thing I did as a writer. In my second nonfiction book, I reclaimed my inheritance, two and a half acres of worthless Florida scrubland that had been stolen by a band of redneck hog hunters. No bullets, no book, my editor had told me. So he was delighted when I called to let him know the rednecks had shot up my cabin and torched my jeep. <laughs> But the most dangerous thing I'd ever done was write a joint memoir with my wife about our courtship and marriage. I always remind my students and friends to never, ever do something as stupid as that. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm writing a book about faith along borders where religions and cultures collide. But the only border that really interests me right now is the one between Turkey and Syria. And the only thing I've found so far is the story that I didn't tell the woman from Kyrgyzstan. How that story began is what I'm offering you tonight. When I first moved out here to Texas, I was bankrupt and living in an abandoned farmhouse uh, on the edge of a canyon out past Crosbyton. I didn't have the money to go to Dallas, much less the Middle East. But I was teaching here at Tech. And one day in 2012, I read that the university's ethics center was offering a $1,000 travel grant for a faculty member who intended to deliver a scholarly paper at an international ethics conference. I'd never delivered a paper anywhere. I was a professor of creative writing, which, as you know, has very little to do with either scholarship or ethics. <laughs> But I clicked out online to see if I could find an international ethics conference anywhere near the Middle East. Lo and behold, there was one. On the island of Cyprus, in the eastern Mediterranean, only 90 miles from the coast of Syria. Cyprus had been St. Paul's first stop on those famous mission trips of his. The island was shaped like an eagle's claw, and the narrow eastern tip of that claw pointed straight toward the border between Turkey and Syria, straight toward the ancient city of Antioch, which had once been part of Syria itself. A thousand dollars wasn't enough for a round-trip ticket, but at least it would get me to Cyprus. I could find my own way from there. So I started thinking about this paper I intended to deliver, but hadn't written yet. The theme of the conference was the ethical challenge of multidisciplinarity. And you're right, spell check couldn't find that word either. <laughs> Colon, reconciling the three narratives, art, science, and philosophy. So I entitled my paper, When Philosophers Shoot from the Hip and Literary Artists Shoot Back. Colon, the case for reconciliation. <laughs> <laughs> I emailed that title in a 250-word abstract to the conference website. The chair of one of the panels thought the material provocative. In short, he invited me to present that paper at the University of Cyprus in Nicosia, the country's capital, and the Ethics Center at Tech awarded me $1,000 to do so. Now, I figured the paper I dreamed up would serve a double purpose. It would not only get me to within 90 miles of Syria, 
but it would also satisfy an old grudge I harbored against a former colleague of mine at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where I taught for 20 years before going bankrupt and moving to Texas. This colleague's name was James Rachels. He was a philosopher, and his specialty was theorizing about ethics. One of his most famous essays on the subject had been titled, When Philosophers Shoot from the Hip. I'd never read it, but I'd incorporated it. <laughs>